<laughs> You'll see that the chat is open. Um, we placed the Hillel Facebook and Instagram pages in there, and we hope you'll follow in both places for all the updates on happenings at the school. Again, I see more people popping in, so I'm actually going to pause for a moment because I don't want anyone to miss some of the presentation. But if you're just joining us, I'm Ruthie Fierberg. I'm your host for the afternoon. We're really excited to welcome you to part two of Hillel Academy of Greater Dayton's 60th anniversary celebration. Thank you for being here. It's fun to see where everyone's tuning in from. Some people are outside. It looks really nice out. Some people are in the car. Dedication. I love it. All right. So today we're going to reflect on Hillel's beautiful six decade history, learn more about what it is going on at Hillel today, and speak about navigating Jewish identity and the place for Jewish education as we all move forward. We'll see some short presentations from Hillel. I'll be speaking with Hillel's longtime educator, Sandy Sloan Brenner. And we have a special guest with us for our keynote conversation. Alexandra Silver is a Grammy-nominated singer, Broadway performer, and celebrated author. And she and I will discuss how our Judaism impacts our art and more. But first, I'd like to hand it over to Hillel's board president, Andy Schwartz. Andy? Thank you, Ruthie. So thank you to everyone joining us today. It's an absolute joy to be able to celebrate Hillel's 60th anniversary here today and hear from our special MC Ruthie Fearberg and guest performer Al Silber. Uh, so thank you very much for, for helping us celebrate this special occasion. And uh, we're excited to hear about your reflections on Jewish identity in the arts. Hillel Academy has been teaching Torah and passing on to our children here in Dayton Jewish values and traditions for 60 years. We need Hillel more than ever to ensure that our children can experience the deep inner joy and gratitude that comes from having a spiritual connection with God through Torah, and to bring to our community and our world the spirit of compassion that comes from our tradition. And no one exemplifies the spirit of joy, gratitude, and community more than Sandy Sloan Brenner, who's been passing along our timeless traditions to our children for 50 of Hillel's 60 years. So it's just an amazing uh, uh, career that Sandy has had. We're so thankful for having her in our community and all the wonderful things she's done with our children and helped to shape them and help them grow. So to, um, to recognize Sandy, I'm going to introduce Dr. Kathy McCauley, Hillel's Director of Curriculum and Instruction, who will um, speak next. But first, I do want to mention Dr. McCauley and her husband, Dan McCauley, have been leading Hillel for over 10 years, and they will be retiring at the end of this year. So I do want to recognize them and thank them for their service and dedication to ensuring that the school has had a strong, such a strong impact on our children uh, during their term. So Dr. McCauley, it's over to you. Okay. Thank you, thank you Andy. Um, in honor of Hillel's 60th anniversary, the staff and students at Hillel are working on a musical that is based on stories that Hillel alumni shared with us last summer about their favorite Hillel memories. In this production, our students are portraying Hillel grads, now quite elderly, who have gathered for a reunion. And during Friday's rehearsal, it occurred to me that one of the stories that two students share really gets to the essence of what makes our honored guest a loved and revered teacher for generations of Hillel students. Please enjoy this exchange between two of our fourth graders, Lucian and Levi, as an introduction to our honoree, Mrs. Sandy Sloan Brenner. Who is especially gifted at teaching little ones Jewish ways of life. She was once explaining how the word rabbi meant my teacher. A little kid got a bit confused announcing Mrs. Salome Brenner was the rabbi of Lael. What's that you said? Mrs. Sloan Brenner is a 
rabbi now? I must congratulate her. No, no, it was a misunderstanding. Oh, I see. I seem to misunderstand a few things from time to time because people just don't seem to talk as distinctly as they did back in the day. There we go. Hi, Sandy. How are you today? <laughs> I'm excited, but very nervous. Thank you. <laughs> no reason to be nervous. We're here to talk about you. And I want to know all those years ago when you were first looking towards a career, did you always want to be a teacher specifically of Judaic studies? I always wanted to be a teacher from childhood on. I've always enjoyed working with children, beginning as a camp counselor, tutor, assistant director of the JCC camp in Cincinnati, as well as other various activities within the Jewish community. I began my career in elementary education when I moved to Dayton from Cincinnati and was fortunate enough to be hired by Hillel Academy. Judaism has always been at the center of my life. And when offered the opportunity, to teach Judaism and Judaic studies specifically at Hillel, I jumped at the chance. It is my honor and pleasure to pass on my love of Judaism to my students in the form of our love of Hashem, Torah, values, acts of kindness, prayers, and so on. And I have to say this, what a blessing it has been for me. That's so wonderful to hear. So Sandy, looking back on 50 years worth of students, I'm wondering if you can describe a couple of your most rewarding instances as a teacher at Hillel, maybe a time or two when you felt like you really got through to a student or just a couple of memories that you'll never forget. That's my favorite part of this. One mitzvah that we do is tzedakah, giving of charity. Over the years, the students have been wonderful about giving tzedakah. One time, one of my younger students needed help to fold the paper money that he had brought that day to put in our tzedakah can. As I helped him, I noticed that it was a $50 bill. Not trying to burst his thoughtful, charitable moment, I carefully asked where he got the money. He smiled and replied that he had gotten it from the coffee table in his living room. Of course, my alarms were going off. So I had, I said to him, I'll just let mommy know so she doesn't go looking for it. I called his mother and she told me that she had put it on that table for the housekeeper. Oh, no. We both talked about it, and I told her he had a very generous son, and that it had been meant as a beautiful mitzvah. Of course, I gave it back to her, pick him up, up at the end of the school day. A second rewarding memory that I'll never, ever forget was relayed to me by a student's parent at a parent-teacher conference. She informed me that Whenever there was a storm, their young son would crawl into bed with her and her husband. One stormy night, that didn't happen, and it concerned her as to why her son didn't follow the usual stormy night ritual. She went to check on him. To her amazement, he was sound asleep with his sea door laying open Aww. on his chest. Yeah. Another precious story that I would like to share, and uh, it just gives me such, such a pleasure to do this, that during our davening time in class one day, when it was time to do the Shema, I noticed that the children had all placed their Sidurim against their chests with one hand on the Sidur and the other hand covering their eyes which of course they do cover their eyes for the Shema, but putting their Siddur up to their chest, they don't usually do. And they recited the Shema and the Vihafta. This became part of their prayer ritual from that day forward. What a beautiful heartfelt sight. 
these are just three of the many rewarding instances that have occurred during my time at Hillel. But it sounds like you really have instilled, like you said, those values of tzedakah, the value of prayer that, you know, the first example you gave us, that student saw money lying, what he thought was lying around, right? That was going unused yeah. and thought to himself, here is the purpose for this because I'm learning it from my teacher. And the same thing with the thunderstorm, right? This idea of, I have been taught that this is a way to comfort myself, to comfort others. And here in this moment of fear, I know how to ground myself because again, I was taught it through my Jewish education. Well, I, I'm glad that they, that they do feel that way because it's so important. It really is. Yeah. What are some of the biggest changes in Jewish education since you've been in the field for so long? When you compare today to say your first five or even 10 years of teaching? I believe that one of the biggest changes in all education, both secular and Judaic, has been the resources that become available for use both in and out of the classroom, specifically the availability and the use of electronics to access the many sources of information that are at our fingertips. However, I do believe that there is no, absolutely no substitute for the continued use of books and other hands-on materials. Even in these modernized times, I will always treasure these resources. And I have to tell you, my husband will back me up on that because we have a house filled, filled with books and important materials for me to teach my Judaic studies. <laughs> also, the many changes going on in the world around us, which affect our daily lives, such as the COVID pandemic, are presenting new and challenging situations, which carry into the classroom discussions. Naturally, as the teacher, I have to find a way to handle these topics in an age-appropriate manner for my students. Hmm. Do you find that your students are asking different questions today than they were many years ago? Definitely. Definitely, yes, I do. Yeah. yeah. And many of them, like I said, pertaining to all the things that are going on around them at this present time, COVID being a very scary situation. Yes, they do. They do ask a lot of questions about that. Yeah. Why would you say is Jewish education, specifically Jewish education, is important mm -hmm. today? Okay. Jewish education is still important today in order to let our children know that they are not alone that Hashem is always with them, no matter what. To let them know that they are, are part of a bigger family that goes back to Avraham and Sarah. Being Jewish means that Israel will always be a part of us and we will always, and especially and, to make sure that the core values and history of our religion and our people are not lost to the future generations. Right, that even in a world where religious expression varies so much that the continuation of an identity is important to be learning about so that you Very can take that forward in whatever way you express it, but so that you have the foundation of that. Exactly, and it helps to give them, I've noticed, a good self-image each and every person is important. Each and every poor person has a gift. And, and to me, that's so important that they realize that. Yeah. What would you say success looks like for you? For me, it has always been my goal to make a positive impact on the lives of my students. My prayer is that I have made a positive difference in their lives. I have to say this, I love teaching, but I also love learning. Hmm. 
especially from my students. Such yeah. a gift, such a gift to be able to teach and learn at the same time. Right. And it's, it's a beautiful gift. Well, Sandy, and, uh, thank you so much for all of your years of service to the school, to raising generations of students. I mean, 50 years, that is multiple generations of students. And we are grateful to you. And to express our gratitude, now we have a video for you. So thank you so much for being here today. And we're going to roll that tape. <laughs> Can I say one more thing? Is that of possible? Of course. I want to give a special thank you for putting today's program together to Andy Schwartz, Hillel's board president, to Kate, Ruthie, and also to Marcy and Mindy and Mark. And um, also a special thank you goes to Dr. McCauley and Dan for them working so hard on this presentation and for the pleasure of working with them these past years. And also I would be remiss if I did not also acknowledge Sandy Van Horn for all of her hard work in the Hillel office, working with this and all the teachers with whom I have a big thank you also goes to the parents, families, and friends of all the students who I have taught over the years. And even a bigger thank you goes to my students I've had the pleasure of teaching and learning from through the years. And I would be remiss if I didn't say a big thank you to my family and my husband for being by my side through my many years of teaching. I love all of you and thank you so much. And by the way, um, Dr. McCauley, yes, those two students sitting there like that, hmm, hmm, I guess that's supposed to be me, huh, sitting there too, just like that. <laughs> Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you so much to Sandy for all of your years of continued service. And of course, I wanted to remind everyone that we will have about 15 minutes at the end of today's event to answer questions um, about anything related to Hillel today. Andy and Kathy will be on hand. So please put your questions in the chat now. We'll include them in our audience Q&A but I am thrilled to move to our kind of keynote section of the afternoon. It is my honor to introduce Alexandra Silber. Al, as she is known to me <laughs> and many people, um, grew up outside Detroit and spent her high school years at Interlochen Center for the Arts. She graduated later with a degree in acting from the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland in Glasgow. She made her West End debut, which is the Broadway of the UK located in London. So she made her West End debut in Andrew Lloyd Webber's The Woman in White. In the UK, Al has also played Huddle in Fiddler on the Roof, Julie Jordan in Carousel, and Lily slash Kate in Kiss Me Kate, and most recently after the pandemic as a principal in Paula Vogel's Indecent. She was nominated for a Grammy for her performance as Maria on the symphonic album of West Side Story, and on Broadway, she has performed in Masterclass alongside Tyne Daly and played Seidel in Fiddler on the Roof. Inspired by playing Huddle and later Seidel, Al wrote the novel After Anatevka, which explores what happens to Huddle after her father Tevya leaves her at the train station when she goes to find her love Perchik. Al is also the author of the unbelievable memoir, White Hot Grief Parade. And I could sing her praises for forever, but then we would never hear from her. So I'll stop now. 
But thank you, Al, so much for being here. Hi, Ruthie. And thank you, Hillel Dayton, for having me. I'm so honored to be here. Um, so those of you who weren't at my talk from November, um, a little bit about me to give a preface to Al, but I grew up in West Hartford, Connecticut. I grew up having Shabbat dinner every Friday night and shul every Shabbat morning. And I was a blended kind of creature because I attended a conservative shul, but my extended family was Orthodox. I'm Ashkenazi and Sephardic. It's like all this stuff. But Al, you have your own unique story of your Jewish identity. So I wanted to start at that beginning when you could tell us about your Jewish background and what role Judaism played like in that early part of your life. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think I have a very, in a lot of ways, like sort of typical uh, blended family American story and a story that's really heavily dependent on um, the mark, both positive and negative, of assimilation. Mm -hmm. And um, so my my father, Michael Silber, um, who passed away in 2001 when I was 18, he is Jewish, came from a Jewish family. The Silbers go all the way back to what is now modern day Ukraine, Odessa. And my mother is from a Catholic family and they met and married, fell madly in love on an airplane in Spain. And, you know, what's really interesting is growing up uh, in Detroit, you know, as you all know, as Midwestern Jews, uh, Detroit uh, has a huge Jewish population. It's the second largest in America. So I grew up really surrounded by Jewish culture and going to shul every once in a while, going to other people's uh, bar and bat mitzvahs, weddings, etc. But I think um, I was deeply impacted by my grandparents' desire to profoundly assimilate and be perceived as American in what the greatest generation considered to be American Jews. Um, I think their Judaism was very much uh, cultural, was very much social, but it was not liturgical. And uh, so I really grew up um, open-minded, but with a lot of questions deeply rooted in the culture, but not in the liturgy. And um, and of course, um, I should mention though that my, my relationship with my grandparents was complex. It was very uh, fractious actually. And I think um, one of the things that deeply impacted my ability to own my Jewish identity growing up was the fact that they insisted upon the fact that I was not Jewish and would never be Jewish enough for their esteem. And so I felt that so many of these things were going to be kept from me and that any curiosity would be squelched. It was really only in, in being immersed in Jewish theater that I felt that I had these things to say and rights to speak up. And it was actually quite, I actually don't think that you, Ruthie, and I have ever talked about it in this paradigm before. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that was really fascinating, um, especially now that I can compare and contrast doing Fiddler in England and doing it on Broadway, was when I was in England, England, of course, is a Christian country. So many of us probably watch the coronation and are deeply aware of how Christian the country is as of Saturday. Um, and the Jewish population is very small and very Hasidic and they stick to their own communities, particularly on the northeast side of London. Mm. Um, and so when we were doing Fiddler on the Roof in 2006 to 2008, first of all, we were the first revival of the musical to be done since the original production. And in addition, I was one of three Jews in a cast of 40. And I'll say that in the in the reverse on Broadway, those statistics, of course, were reversed, right? There's almost this um, assumption of Judaism just by living in New York City. Mm. But what was really fascinating was people would come to me with complete tabula rasa of Jewish tradition, having not absorbed it at all. And I found that I knew and loved and revered so many more of the traditions, the prayers, the beliefs, the customs, then I realized, and I realized that I was becoming to this English company, an ambassador. And I therefore took it on my shoulders to be the very best Jewish ambassador I could be. And so I dove into the research the way I would for any normal acting project, but it took on a really profound significance because I think my grandparents were far away and long gone. I was here in this new environment and Judaism felt 
like it could belong to me in, mm. in my way. And it began um, a really profound journey to embracing my own Judaism in adulthood in both a spiritual, a cultural and a liturgical way. Was it really like, obviously, like you said, the relationship between you and your grandparents was complex and, and the assimilation piece was really at the forefront. Do you think that that's why you didn't feel as much of an ownership until you were able to go into the research or were there other things like in the culture at large there in the cities that you lived in that were preventing you from getting close to that piece of you? I think that's a great question. Um, and I don't exactly know the like absolute emotional truth of that. Um, you know, and I think that a lot of other things took priority for me as a teenager up to and including my father's health and having all these big questions. And for me, I think the first God I turned to was the God of art. You know, I would ask these big questions and I would have conversations to address them, not with my peers, but with with Tolstoy and John Steinbeck and theater. Um, I think that was my first port of call. But yeah, I think the resistance from my family was profound. And when, I, when, when that sort of neutralized, I was able to really feel the rising of this spiritual desire within me without any other noise, if that makes any sense. And yeah. it's something I'm still sort of thinking about, but that's what say, I'm like, right now. You, you say that like you felt this opportunity to be a Jewish ambassador. Yeah. And you and I are so similar in that, like, give us a research project, right? Like, we're so oh, happy, like, totally. please let me dive in. Was there a moment or even just a period of time when you felt it as a shift from like, I'm doing this so I can present to others and when it became personal, when it That's became such a great question. for myself? Yeah, what a, oh my gosh, such a good question. I think it's funny, if I look backward, you know, when you're sort of in the middle of a moment, you're not aware that you're in the middle of a moment, but then you look back and you're like, that was the moment. So interestingly, when my father passed away, all of the frack, and this is all in White Hot Grief Parade, as you know, because you've, you've read and we've interviewed about it before, but um, when my father eventually passed away, the fractions in my family, as is as often the case with some huge life event in a family, really sort of came to the forefront and so I think some people come together and some people, all the, all the bugs crawl out of the wall. And the real saving grace for me was the fact that my father was going to be having a service in a Jewish temple. Mm -hmm. And I was ostensibly meeting a rabbi who was going to be performing the eulogy for my father. He came over to our house on the worst day of my life. And I was 18 years old. Ooh, I was 18 years old and my entire family was sitting in front of him to share stories with him for him to put a, a 30 minute eulogy together in this hour. And something happened to me that day, some force so beyond anything I recognized that it had, you know, in my mind, it had to be God. <laughs> But it took me over and made me brave in the face of my very domineering family to speak from my heart about the person my father was rather than necessarily his resume or how it made other people in the family look. It was one of the holiest things I've ever embarked upon. And that rabbi, Rabbi Daniel Syme, um, said something I'll never forget and gave me a gift I'll never forget where he said, you know, I don't, I don't really know a lot about your, your family. I don't know if you believe in God, but I know I do. And right now he's giving me a huge signal that this girl needs to give this eulogy. And it was the greatest gift, not only to my healing and to my life, but it, and to my father's life, but to my Jewish journey, because I met with him a few times, not only before, during, and after. And I feel that Rabbi Sim put the boat in the direction of a certainty of God and everything else in my life pro pro provided the wind in the sails, but he pointed the boat. And actually, um, as, as an interesting sort of like epilogue to that, Rabbi Syme is the only character 
in both my books for this exact reason. He is the mentor and true believer in young Perchik in Afghana Tevka in a fictionalized version of himself. And of course, I deeply honor his real story and contribution to my story in White Hot Grief Parade. And it's quite funny because I, I lost track of Rabbi Syam um, when I went to college. And I guess when the when after Anatevka came up came out a few years ago, someone was walking through the halls of Temple Bethel in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, and said, Rabbi, your name is in this book. Your exact name is in this book. And you should read this book. And he, he got a copy of the book and he goes, I know this girl. And so what was so wonderful was I didn't realize it was going to be a sort of homing signal, but the book, the, the impact he made on me made it into the art and the art was a lighthouse that brought us back together. And now we're deeply in touch and it's been a really important part of my adult life. And of course, uh, a guiding principle of my adult faith. Yeah, but I think that what I hear that is most important for everyone to realize from that story is what he did was open a door for you. Completely. Right? Like, I think, you know, in having my own um, Jewishly blended family and identity, I think there are so many things that I can observe of like, you know, you're not, it's not, you don't do it this way, so it's not right. Or you don't do it that way, so it's not right. Or, um, you know, you didn't grow up this way. So you're not really like, you know, there can be so many doors shut and so many ways that you're not quote Jewish enough, which is a, you know, a a concept that drives me insane. But I think that what I hear from your story is that the more open you are, which is really a Jewish principle in and of itself, the more you make room for people to find their own spirituality, their own connection to God, and you encourage Judaism to flourish, right? Like what, what a difference it would have been of like a cutting off versus an opening towards. Absolutely. I mean, even his, even the, even his grace in allowing me to stand at the Bema and deliver a eulogy in a temple that was not my own. Um, when when asked about it in, in hindsight, he always said it just, it felt like a divine act to allow you to do this. And, um, and you know, one of the things I think is really, since we're here for Hillel, right? And, and about Jewish education and liturgical education, you know, one of the things I think is really crucial is, I think a lot, there's a big misunderstanding. I think this is just my opinion that that if we study liturgy, if we pray, if we're righteous, if we practice teshuvah, that it will change what happens to us, Mm. which is, I I think it's it's about, if I do this, I will be rewarded this way. Mm -hmm. And actually what the liturgy states and claims is that Jewish education, study prayer righteousness and teshuvah don't change what happens to us they change us right and i think that that is something i've profoundly experienced that transformation and i think you know going to the greatest transformation we make as jews on an annual basis is on yom kippur right we we engage in this huge spiritual transformation that is profoundly real if you really go for it yeah. and it begins with the acknowledgement that we need to transform mm-hmm. right? right and it's not something that we do for our amusement or for social acceptance we do it we don't do it for the sake of convention it's a spiritual necessity right and um and i think i felt the seed of that thanks to rabbi Sang. but i've i've taken it up upon myself and And it's been one of the most rewarding things in my life. And I find it so fascinating that like, right, you, you're growing up in Detroit, like it's mostly around you. And Uh like you said, your first way in was art and he ended up right. Completing the loop because he ends up in art. And now, I mean, on and on, but I want to rewind to when you were playing huddle, Uh what first inspired the, the kernel that then became after Anatevka, because this is a group who hasn't heard you talk about this book. And I find 
just the way in and your thoughts and the research endlessly fascinating. Oh, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you. It, you know, it, again, like going back to the you and me are so similar, like give me a research project. And, you know, I think one of the things that we sometimes forget about just the nature of curiosity, which of course, like curiosity is one of the things that makes humanity so unique and great is our ability to pursue a gap in knowledge, right? Like we go, this is something I know, this is something I don't know. And curiosity is the energy that takes us from point A to point B. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when I was doing, so I should say that the the run of that West End Fiddler on the Roof was was long. It was about two and a half years long. And so there was this moment when the daily discovery on stage, the daily creativity sort of ceased and the joy of performance took over. And I realized that I am a deeply creative person that requires the energy of creation to feel satisfied by life. And I had this wonderful job, which was really performance forward. And if I was going to be creative on a daily basis, I needed to take charge of that myself. Um, I started writing a, a blog, a silly blog. Um, it's still up there. Remember blogs, everybody? Um, it's still up there called London Still. And it was really just this place for me to be like, um, allow me to write an essay about raspberry jam and why it is superior. One of your favorite essays. Yeah, exactly. Because why it is superior to all other jam, duh. Um, you know, all sorts of silly things, but also about like the life of an expat, an American living abroad in London. Uh, what is it like to be a lead in a West End musical? You know, it was, I didn't even really realize that I had an audience exactly. It was just, I don't know, sort of the gift of ignorance made me very brave, right? Um, somebody approached me one night, someone came to my, to my show to, um, to the play and said, you know, hey, I, I came to the show. I've, I just Googled you and I found this blog. I'm a literary agent. Have you ever considered writing something long form like a novel? And I was like, no, don't you see that I write about jam? You know, like, please. Um, but she really insisted that I meet with her. And this wonderful woman, Louise Lamont, I will never ever forget her, I'll be able to thank her enough. But she was the one that really gave me the idea she's like you know i'm just curious if any piece of art has ever meant the most to you and huddle meant so much to me not just because of the jewish identity story but i think also because of the father-daughter relationship and specifically with huddle for those and i know i'm preaching to the jewish choir here but um for those of you for the, the person on the call that might not have seen fiddler um huddle is the daughter that sings far from the home i love before she says her final words on stage, Papa, God alone knows when we shall see each other again. And if you can imagine, just four years prior to this production, I had lost my own father and been deprived of a goodbye. So this took on extraordinary significance. Huddle, in so many ways, was me in a different set of circumstances. And I was, I was so clearly seeing the parallels between an 18 year old girl that left everything she knew to go pursue her dreams in the UK and this 18 year old girl that gets on a train to Siberia leaves her family and everything she knows. And I became sort of obsessed with what happened to Hoddle and to women like her. And what began as a question, you know this, right? What began as like, I wonder what happened to people that went to join fiancés was it different from people that joined their spouses? Uh, where did they go? What were they, how, how long did it take her to get there? Does she have to be processed? Did she have to register? Like what happened? Also like, and this is not the age of even regular phones, let alone cell phones. Like no. how do you find a person when you just like go somewhere? Right, like how do you do that? I'm here. <laughs> I'm a project, project. Like just screaming across Siberia, the Ural Mountains, hoping it'll ring out, totally. So, you know, these gaps in my knowledge like led to unbelievable articles and books and huge shadow laden pieces of information and parts of history that I don't, I certainly don't, I have yet to, to see a lot of uh, storytelling about. And it's brutal. And some of it is absolutely beyond comprehension harrowing, but it also then felt like something I had to do because brave Jewish women like Hoddle, who joined their partners across 
you know, 5,000 kilometers across the planet, endured so much for love. And by not including all of the harrowing details, I didn't honor her and everyone like her. Um, it meant I went to actual, y'all, I went to actual Siberia. I did. Yeah, I did. lived in a yurt. I lived in a yurt. I tripped over a cow in the middle of the night. There was a lot going on. And, um, and it was one of the most rewarding, life expanding experiences of my life. And I finished the, um, I, the one of the other main characters, in addition to Huddle and Perchick, is Seidel. It was sort of a coincidence. I finished my manuscript in the summer of 2013. I even remember the moment I pressed the end because I put it down in my journal. Mm. And then two years later, I was cast as Seidel in Fiddler on the Roof it, on Broadway. And the, the manuscript had just been sitting on my desktop, but that was the moment that really felt like cherry, cherry, cherry on the slot machine. I was like, well, if I'm going to sell this book, it's going to be in this moment. Mm. But what was really interesting too was I had grown and shifted. I was ideally suited at that moment in my life to tell Seidel's story. How much more thoroughly could I have, in some ways, literally lived Huddle's journey internally and geographically? Right. And, and so much of the manuscript changed um, in my grief journey, in understanding Seidel's point of view. And that's when the right, book was, was people born. people who haven't read the book, so, ma- so much of it is letters back and forth. And so yeah. you have letters in Seidel's hand that yeah. when you're more inside who she is, I, it makes perfect sense that those letters and her voice in the manuscript would adjust to that. Totally. And what's interesting, if you think about it from a both artistic, but also like psychological point of view, in so many ways, that epistolary communication between Seidel and Huddle was such a communication between my older and younger self, you know? Yeah. So um, to be in service to those women, but also to work through some of those questions myself. And Seidel is a, a woman, at least my version of her both on stage and page, um, is a woman of great, great faith mm-hmm. and dignity and and femin- a feminine hero in, in the classical sense. And I, I, one of the things I love about um, about these women, not only in the Shalom Aleichem stories and in the musical that we all know and love so well, but hopefully in the contribution I've made to their continuation, is they do the very Jewish thing of asking how they can contribute in their present tense reality and make the world a better place today. Mm-hmm. How can they transform their experience of harrowing reality and find joy. And I think there's no one on earth that does that better than the Jewish people. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, you know, you've had that like very specific journey with the with those characters. And then since then, you have done shows like Indecent, you did a play mm-hmm. off Broadway um, called The Lucky Star that had, you know, themes and and setting of the Holocaust. Um, but of course you do things that are not related at, that are seemingly not related at all, at least on the surface of, you know, whether it's Camelot or, um, you know, a play about Einstein or what have you. So yeah. how does your Judaism, like what role does it play when you're in something very Jewish on, mm-hmm. on its face versus when you're in something that is not so Jewish on its face? Yeah. Well, it's always there. And it's certainly about it's certainly about ethos. Um, it's certainly about integrity, right? And I I often ask myself, you know, um, is how I always ask myself whenever I'm playing any character, like how may I serve this character? Um, and sometimes the service to that is to be completely ignorant. Like a great example of that actually is I played Sally Bowles in Cabaret. And her ignorance, her almost willful ignorance, a very anti-heroic woman there, um, it's actually important that I represent people that were going, no, 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 no. And that like the actor is, is aware and understands that what's happening around Sally is horrific and personal and part of mine and our shared collective 
trauma, but that my role there is to honor her role in the story, right? And what was one of the people that uh, silence perpetuated the situation. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's always, it's on stage and off, it's about going, you know, are there Jewish themes here? Um, how can I share my Jewishness backstage in a positive and joyful way? And I think especially in these pieces, I, you know, and I, I have things to say, I know you do too. I do, I, while I definitely believe we need to keep talking about the never again stories, right? It's so important that Holocaust literature and Holocaust art is made and seen by people that have not consumed it. I think I would love there to be an equal amount of stories that celebrate and contain Jewish joy. Um, I think that always emphasizing Jewish trauma does us a great disservice. And um, I, would, I would love for that to be a part of my future and the future of the art form as well. Yeah. But the grasping joy in the face of, uh, in the face of tragedy, of adversity, of oppression is such a Jewish characteristic. And of course, something that's been tested within an inch of its life. But that said, um, I think one of my, and you and I've talked about this endlessly, that I, I genuinely believe in my deepest soul that Jewish joy is the ultimate radical act in the face of hatred and misunderstanding, that being Jewish joyfully is one of the most powerful things we can all do. And what better way to do that than to share our Judaism, to learn more about it, to share it joyfully with others, and to live, even in the face of oppression and hatred and violence, to hold that joy in our hearts every day and carry it like a like a candle. And it makes so much sense hearing you say all of these things of like how, you know, even from your roles, how do, how do I serve? How am I conceiving of this? What is the lesson? And then moving into what am I sharing? What is the mm -hmm. message? What is the joy? And if you don't already follow out on Instagram, you have to, because first of all, it's such an entertaining page. But what I love is that in this phase of your life, like, I don't know if this would have been there five, seven, 10 years ago, but I don't recently, think so. right. Like around Hanukkah, it's like, what is the actual Hanukkah story? Like what, like to tell the world that is shopping and sees a menorah next to the Christmas tree in the window, like, what is this holiday actually about? The same thing with Purim, you know, and like a series of videos that really share with like, and you know, you have the music and you have your props and you have, it's, it is that artist storyteller in you taking that service and that message and that joy and packaging all pieces of you together. And I think that that's something that we can look to from Jewish identity to Jewish education as like both a model and a product of. Yeah, I hope so. I think it, I, I hope it's a version of Jewish education in, an, in the, the positive use of social media, right? That I reach people I might not otherwise reach and people that know me for a different reason, such as authorial work or theater or singing, but can receive something they might not have expected from me or expected at all in their daily feed that is um, not only educational and not only informative, but full of celebratory joy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Al, thank you so much for being with thank us you, today. Thank you. Ah, ah, I'm so honored. I will, I will put the... Um, I, I know. I will put the links to my books in the chat if anyone yes, is. Yes, please do. You can find more of Al at alexandrasilber.net. She's going to put the links in the chat for her books. You can follow her on Instagram at Al Silbs, which mm -hmm. I again highly recommend. Um, and just thank you so much for being here and for spreading all of the Jewish joy that you do. It is my total honor and always an honor to talk to you. Um, see you soon. Bye, Al. Bye. All right, so we are winding down. We want to remind you to follow Hillel on Facebook and Instagram. And we're approaching the time for questions about Hillel today. So a reminder to put your questions in the chat. Andy and Kathy are at the ready to answer. Um, and as you type in your questions, please enjoy this video about the Hillel experience today. Kate, take it away. We're very intentional at Hillel 
working with kids so that they really learn to take ownership of their own learning. Teachers work with them in terms of what are your goals for this, let's say, upcoming term. Then we have a strategy for doing that and we have periodic check-ins to see how that's coming along. My oldest daughter goes to Hillel and she loves it. It's just a really great small knit community for her. They're getting this great academic and Jewish education and it in a year they're like casually, you know, Hebrew words are in their conversations and they're singing songs and they know the prayers and it's really moving and really cool to see it just be this part of their lives. Every year we do musical performances which gives them the opportunity for some music education and also some dance education and things like that. And it incorporates also so much social emotional learning into that because for kids to understand that there's something a little bit bigger than just themselves going on, that they're integrating into this group project and not just an individual and that they kind of come together that way is always fun to see. Our daughter was in kindergarten with a class of 10. Our son was in third grade with a class of 13, I think, and just the difference is it's so palpable between the one-on-one -on -one attention they get and then also just the relationships with the teachers. Hillel is like a really unique school because it, it takes people from every part of the community. I mean, the Reform Rabbi sends her daughter there and, you know, the Orthodox kids are there and they're just all mixing and feeling like one close-knit community, and I think that's really unique. I'm really proud to say that our graduates are very active in the Jewish community. They are oftentimes in leadership roles, and they really are living out Jewish values. Terrific. Well, I can say that I witnessed this all firsthand when I came to Dayton in November and had the chance to work with some of the current students who just stole my heart. Um, they are fabulous little learners and thinkers and so in touch with their emotions. And like we said, their values, they're, they're smart and astute. And um, of course, all of that is being cultivated through their education at Hillel. So um, thank you all for your support of the institution, and we're just so grateful. Um, I wasn't seeing any questions in the chat, but if you have them, you can put them in there. Um, Andy and Kathy, perhaps you would like to expand a little if we until we have questions or if we don't have questions, just on what we saw, um, some of the things that you're seeing as rewarding on the day-to-day. -day. Um, anything you'd like to share about Hillel today, Andy or Kathy. Thanks, Ruthie. I would just like to say that um, it has been our joy to um, be at Hillel and lead the school for the last 12 years. Um, the school, I think, is a success because of what uh, Steve Levinson said on the video of people really coming together and forming a community. And that's not only been because of the parents, um, the children, but also the faculty. Um, people like Sandy Sloan Brenner um, exudes her joy um, of Judaism. Our secular teachers who are not Jewish have learned so much about Judaism and incorporate that into their classrooms. Rabbi Simon just does a masterful job of sharing Parsha each week with the children and really making that Parsha meaningful to them um, in addition to the classroom teaching that he does. So it's been um, an, an enriching experience. And I think what Dan and I are the most proud of is the fact that the children who have been at Hillel and go beyond Hillel really do live out Jewish lives. And we find from our alumni that they're leaders in their communities, they're actively engaged in uh, their synagogues or temples, and they make us very proud. So um, finally, Sandy Sloan Brenner, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure working with you over the years. And uh, when she talked with me about her retirement, 
I said, well, you know, you don't necessarily have to totally retire. And she was very interested in that idea. And she will be um, back at Hillel doing a few things next year as well. So thank you so much, Sandy. Yep, I just echo what uh, Kathy said. Just one of the other things about Hillel is uh, making the connection with Israel. And we've always been very strong in uh, focusing on Israel activities and the children ultimately have this love of Israel that manifests itself over time. And as they get older, they want to go to Israel and see it. And I experienced that my, with my own children. So it's just a, another aspect of their Judaism is the connection with, with the state of Israel and support of Israel. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you to those who shared memories of Sandy in the chat. Um, we're grateful to all of you. Again, I'm here to say follow Hillel on Facebook and Instagram so that you don't miss a beat. Um, you can find Al and her work. She left links in the chat as well as Instagram at Al Silbs. You can follow me um, at ruthiefearberg.com and broadwaynews.com and on Instagram at ruthiefearsberg. If you haven't had enough of me and Judaism today, I am actually also leading a talk with those of you who've been paying attention to Netflix. Um, Netflix Jewish Matchmaking premiered on May 3rd, just this past week. It's fabulous. And I have to say, it's kind of a reflection of what Hillel is doing as well. Like we were talking about, Steve talked about um, the multidimensional aspect of the students and their, you know, spectrum of religiosity at Hillel. Um, Jewish matchmaking does a fabulous job in showing all sorts of Jews from all over uh, the United States and Israel. And I am going to be talking to the Jewish matchmaker herself, Aliza Ben Shalom, tonight um, at the 92nd Street Y, which you can live stream. So I mentioned that specifically because we're here, we're Jews. We're happy, and that is our <laughs> Jewish joy tonight. So if you're looking for it, um, 92ny.org, you can get tickets for the live stream. Thank you all so much for coming. I hope you stay safe and healthy. Thank you for your continued support of Hillel, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Oh, and I'm being told if you'd like to hear more from Hillel stories told by Hillel kids, come to Hillel on Thursday, May 18th at six o'clock. Have a great night, everyone.